thank you very much for inviting me and, and also for the opportunity to, to share my work. Um, I will try now to um, share the screen. Um, please interrupt me um, if, if I may some um, a comment or, or a hand up, just, just let me know. Okay, so as you have just heard, today's talk will be um, on, on practices of, of preventive repression in electoral autocracies. The focus is, of course, on, on Russia. Um, and throughout this talk, I will be uh, sharing with you um, evidence from, from protest, public opinion, and, and experimental research that, that we've conducted uh, over the years in Russia. Uh, I should start, however, with the, the story that, that motivates um, the project, and that centers around the events that, that took place in the Russian city of Samara on the 2nd of November 2017, in what um, I'm sure feels like a, a just ago today. So walking around the streets of Samara, this is the city center, uh, bystanders would come across an unusual set of signs that was put up by the local authorities. Um, the signs, and you can see one of them um, on my first slide, read as follows. Um, Dear citizens, it said, um, the, the meeting of December 3rd from 4 to 8 that's supposed to take place in, in Kirov Square is not authorized, right? It's not agreed. The invitation to participate in this, um, in this protest is, uh, is, is illegal and constitutes a violation of social order. And those signs were interestingly signed not by the police authorities, by, by the administration of the city of Samara. Now, had, had those signs not been put up, I, I very much doubt that lots of people would have known about the events. Now you may ask, what does it actually mean that the protest was not authorized or that it was not sanctioned? Well, like, like in democracies, in the, like in the United States, the UK or, or Germany, there is a protest authorization process in place in, in many electoral autocracies. Uh, protest organizers should submit a notification for an event a certain number of days ahead of, of, the, of the protest, and the authorities can then um, review the notification and decide whether to allow the protest to go ahead, require revisions to its uh, timing or, or to its location, or indeed deny authorization altogether on the grounds that the event is, um, is unlawful or, const or violates constitutional uh, order. As I have just mentioned, an authorized protest, those events that take place without the authority's approval, are by definition and by law unlawful. Um, and not just their organization, but also participation in them um, carries administrative and criminal sanctions. In Russia, it's, a, it's administrative for first offenders and then fines escalate. But in countries like um, China and in Singapore, first fines can be criminal as well. Now, this was December 2nd, if you remember. On December 3rd, um, despite the banners and despite the authorities' best efforts, the protest did go ahead. Um, I don't know how well you can see my screen, but I'm sure some of you will be recognizing Alexei Navalny um, taking to, to the stage. Um, and of course, his supporters who were at the time campaigning for him to be able to run on the March 2018 election. Um, not only the demonstrators, but the police also appeared on, on the day and the local press, you know, um, in, in Samara ran stories a title that, you know, eight demonstrators have been arrested, the police took to the stage, this was an unauthorized and indeed an illegal event. Now, in, in my work, I describe this process, the protest authorization and protest denial process, as a strategy of, of repression, of preventive repression. It is repressive because it is discriminate um, and it's used by the authorities to deny people the right to engage in lawfully sanctioned protest because of the content of their speech. Um, in terms of its characteristics, this strategy of repression is of course preventive, right? It is used in anticipation of dissent before protests take place. Um, and it is also non-violent. Right? So the character of the repressive action in this context is, is non-coercive. It, it does not include uh, force or, or violence, the kinds of repression strategies we're used to studying in authoritarian politics. And indeed, these strategies are backed by parliament-approved legislation. 
I should say that it is truly remarkable the amount of time and effort authoritarian leaders um, you know, invest in in order to update their legislation and make sure that the law is up to date and able to deal with such an authorized protest. Um, what I show here, and here uh, there is Russia in red, is that in the past 20 years alone, um, Russian protest legislation, and we're looking at just two pieces of legislation here, has been modified at over 16 times in order to allow the authorities to you know, effectively deal with protests that take place. Um, you will see that most of the protests started in 2000, in early 2000s, but of course intensify in the aftermath of the 2012 electoral protest in Russia. Um, it's not just legislation that is um, that changes in Russia over time. It is also the fines that the authorities can impose on demonstrators who, who take to the streets. And this is a very um, you know, salient issue in Russia today, I should also say, given that the protests we see unfolding are unauthorized. What this uh, graph shows you is the rapid escalation in the average number of fines imposed in Russia across all regions in the past few years. And you see that fines for administrative offenses escalate, even as, even as the overall number of protests declines, right? And I should say uh, from the outset that this is not just a Russia story. Uh, we know that um, non-democracies <laughs> increasingly invest in strategies of, of non-violent repression both in, in, in anticipation in the after, and in the aftermath of dissent. So what I show here is the share of non-democracy, so, so regimes scoring from minus 10 to minus 6 in the polity score, um, that engaged in mass killings against their populations. You can see this declining in this red line here, and also imposing restrictions on assembly. And this is the share of democracies that has increased over time. Um, do we have a question, Nora? Yeah, um, this is just a clarifying question. Thanks. Um, I'm just curious, uh, how would you characterize in sort of democracies, uh, you know, smaller scale restrictions? So like in New York, if you want to have a march, you have to, you're supposed to get approval for it first, right? So is this preventative repression or what is it that sort of defines this as repression, if not that? Absolutely. Thank you, Taryn. Great to see you as well. So what I would say, Nick, of course, protest restrictions exist across regimes, right? Um, it is very common for, for governments, also democratic governments, to require authorization. I think there are some fundamental differences, however, between the use of protest authorizations in democracies and non-democracies. Um, the, the discriminatory use of protest notifications is one of them. So when authorizations are denied on the content of a group's speech and they're systematically and discriminatory declined, then this is repression. I would also not hesitate to characterize, you know, protest permit notifications as repression during the civil rights movement, for example, in the United States, in, in, in democracies when um, you know, um, demonstrators were denied, uh, anti-war demonstrators and, and also um, civil rights demonstrators were denied permits for the content of their speech. There are other differences as well, um, namely about the restrictiveness of protest legislation. So in electoral autocracies, it is illegal to stage protest uh, in response to spontaneous events, for example, which is permitted in cities like New York. Um, in electoral autocracies, it is also, um, the law is more restrictive and does not contain safeguards against its discriminatory use. In the United States, for example, if, if you know, demonstrators felt that they were being discriminated against, they could you know, appeal to courts and seek to hold governments to account. We don't have that in, in democracies. But uh, thank you for the opportunity to clarify that, of course, this is not just a question of, of contemporary electoral autocracies. Indeed, under um, you know, escalated force policing in the United States, protest permits were a key tool of preventive repression. Uh, Katia, I have a question. So I'm thinking if, I don't know if you're going to address the extent to which this, uh, you know, uh, bans on protests are really effective in preventing the actual protests. Yeah, just coming up, coming right up. Okay, but no, because I just wanted to say that if it's to some extent more effective if they don't prevent yeah the protest because it's a great way to figure out who are the true believers who are willing to protest in spite of the ban. And you now Absolutely. have a reason to arrest them as well. 
Absolutely. Like and that's the talk summarized for the audience oh, in, right. okay, okay. in one sentence. No, absolutely. Um, I'm glad. I'm glad that, that, that uh, it's, it's obvious where we're going. And actually, this is the, the third characteristic set that, that, that I want to emphasize, and, and it speaks very well to Pablo's point. So, and for me, it's, it's also the most interesting. And to be honest, this is what got me very much interested in, in this line of work. So the third feature of protest authorization as a strategy of repression, which I think goes against much of what we know about preventive repression, is that they are deliberately designed to be observable, not just to targeted groups, I, you know, demonstrators who are targeted themselves, but also to the mass public, right? The authorities publicly communicate their decision to reject authorizations, be it in banners, I'll, I'll show evidence from federal TV in a minute, um, in announcements on social media, even when, as, as Pablo already noted, rarely deters dissent. Um, and let me give you some evidence to back my claim. So what we have here is hand-coded data on, on protests that take place in Russia from 2017 to 2019. And this red line, um, the share, again, this is all hand-coded data, the share of unauthorized protest in Russia between 2017 and 2018, so in those two years alone. We know that 2017-2018 um, in, in Russia, a year of presidential election, region, uh, campaigning ahead of the presidential election in 2018, uh, regional elections and intense campaigning, approximately 30% of all protests that took place in the country were unauthorized. Um, the share of successfully thwarted, successfully prevented events, which are lost more or less, around 3%. So they're not successful at preventing protest. Uh, I, I can see another hand up. Uh, Sorry, uh, when you said uh, uh, the authorization decision is observable by the, uh, like when you said it is observable, is it observable by the dissenter or is it observable by the general public? The public. So, the, so of course, the dissenters observe the decision. It is formally communicated to them. But I think the argument is also that the authorities do not stay there. Right. So as in the opening slide, they make sure that the general public is aware of what has happened with the authorization protest. So they'll put up banners in the streets, they will post announcements on, on their websites, and they will also, you know, go on social media and say this and this has happened. And I should also say that again, this is not an, an exclusively Russian story. If you think about the um, anti elab protest in, in Hong Kong, for example, there are the police authorities in Russia, it's, it's the local authorities, like the, the administrators who review the permits elsewhere, it's the police. They would um, you know, go as far as to just stage press conferences to tell the people that, look, there is an authorized protest coming up. Demonstrators have not secured that approval. We just want you to, to be aware. Thank you. Thank you for, for the opportunity to clarify. Um, so now we're back. OK. So, and here is evidence from the corpus of, of Channel One stories. So Channel One is a federal channel in, in Russia, and it's one of the leading uh, TV outlets with near full penetration. And what you can see is that, you know, unauthorized protests are indeed covered in, in the press, in, in media. And their coverage tends to spike around periods we would expect it to spike, knowing what we know about protests. So um, we have here the large protest of 2011, 2012. There is a protest in 2017 that I described. And indeed, what was quite unique and, and unprecedented, this is what we have when Navalny comes uh, back to Russia in early 2021, and the authorities really tend to cover uh, the protest. The, there is extensive coverage. There is Duma debut, um, parliament deputies condemning the events before they occur. And, and this is indeed very visible. And here, 2019, these are the Moscow, Duma, um, Moscow City Duma elections uh, when opposition candidates were not allowed to run. So again, deliberately observable, not only to dissidents, but also to the general public. Um, and this really brings me to, to my research question. And, and this is you know, the best audience to, to ask the question to, given that you know, the department has shaped the, the scholarship. So if preventive repression, we know from existing research, is most effective when, when it isn't visible, 
right? Um, and, and, and of course, research shows that and says, you know, very persuasively that, you know, it's, it's more effective when the dictator, when dictators do not need to, to punish, to kill, to, to be seen repressing, um, you know, think about Stalin's and KVD, for example, arresting people in the middle of the night. What is it with the authorities that elect to publicize, not just, you know, the, the rejection of permits, but also if you think about it, the elective publicize their failure to repress. They know that authorizations create very weak deterrence incentives. Probabilities are that protest will go ahead nonetheless, and yet they still do it. And I so think this, there's a question. Oh, Diaz, yeah. you got a question or? Oh, hi, Ekaterina. I'm sorry. Could you please go back to the slide with the uh, number of articles for Channel One? Uh, yes. Is that so is that like? Yeah, it's not the number. It's the share yeah, of share. Mm, yeah. I'm sorry. Share of articles per month. Uh, is that like uh, really articles or like uh, the shares of mentions in the uh, like TV news program? Or no. The, so this is articles. So the unit of analysis are the articles, right? that are published every single day on channel one. From that corpus, we subset to articles that mention protest events. And we have developed um, you know, well-tailored mobilization dictionaries uh, that allow us to subset the full corpus to stories that mention mobilization, right? So any keywords on mobilization, we subset um, and, and we use that corpus. From there, we apply geoclassification, right, using NewsMap uh, to identify which of those stories are in Russia, right? So, so we're left with a, a corpus that describes Russian protest. And then we take that corpus and we apply, again, another, another, another dictionary that describes keywords related to unauthorized events to identify uh, stories that describe unauthorized protest. Um, the dictionary can capture, you know, from one to multiple keywords on unauthorized protest, but we code this into a binary so that we have an authorized event, yes or no, and that's their share of them. Yeah, I got that. But I mean, um, does that necessarily mean that uh, if uh, the news about unauthorized protest are covered in articles, they are necessarily covered in news, in TV news? Because there the, the can be some discrepancy between articles on the site of the channel one and the, the actual TV news. Yes, I think that that is a very good point. Um, we know from work that, you know, for example, Arturas has done, uh, who's, who's here in the audience with us, that um, Channel One tends to be, you know, faithfully, to, to some extent, faithfully transcribing TV news. Um, so, so it provides those extracts in its website. You're absolutely right that that corpus contains additional information, stories that the, the website would post on other occasions. But I think we can confidently say that that this is a representative enough snapshot of you know the nine o'clock news or the six o'clock news that are repeated over time. But yeah, that's thank right. you for and, that. yeah. I mean, like there is like one program in the uh, the Russian TV called uh, Vesti uh, Twenty Four, and they always mention Navalny in the in this site, but never mention them like in TV, uh, even in news. So that's why I ask. Yeah. But thank you. No, no, of course, that, that, that's, that's great to clarify. Um, I think, yes, that, that is why it's so unique, the spike we see in January, that this is really news stories, that the, the stories, short snippets you would watch, you know, at six o'clock, at, at nine o'clock, we, we did not include talk shows into the corpus or, or you know, any, any other program. So it's exclusively news based, but thank you, thank you. Um, all right, so we left with a question. Um, why is it that autocrats uh, advertise um, sorry, I'm going backwards. Why is it that autocrats publicize their um, their failure to repress? Okay, so um, we we have lots to draw on from from existing research, both on repression and authoritarian politics, right? Um, I think, though, to, to some extent, work um, has has mainly in authoritarian politics has mainly focused on autocrats' decision to either permit protest or not to permit them. Right, and we know that autocrats that allow protest uh, do so because they have many benefits from from doing so, including identifying sources of discontent, seeing who's who's performing well, being able to you know prevent rebellions and and, and revolutions before they take place. Um, I think we know less about how autocrats that okay have decided to allow protests to go ahead try to manage and manipulate those protests, perhaps 
you know, in sharp contrast to all this, um, you know, work we have on how autocrats that allow elections try to manipulate them and manage them both in their lead up, but and also in their aftermath. And finally, although in, in recent years, and I think this is a fair statement, and research acknowledges that, you know, investments in nonviolent repression have increased. Um, especially in the aftermath, I have to say, of the Arab Spring and, and, and events in the region, the, the focus um, still in, in authoritarian politics um, largely remains on, on coercive repression, right? So repression that involves violence. We know lots about actors that uh, implement this violence through the security apparatus, the secret forces, et cetera, et cetera. But we know less about non-coercive, non-violent administrative repression, if you like, that is delegated to different actors. So here, the focus is on administrators and sometimes governors that are politically elected and not linked to the security services per se. All right. So as, 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 as we already hinted in, in our discussion, the argument I make um, in this paper and, and in the book project is really that um, some forms of preventive repression, like those considered here, can yield substantially a lot more than just um, you know, stifling dissent or increasing the costs of mobilization. Things that have been traditionally understood, I say, as preventive repression's direct objectives, right? And, and direct effects. Um, my argument is that visible, like deliberately observable preventive repression um, of the type discussed here it has a, a series of indirect effects as well, which involve the, you know, the transfer of information to an audience of non-participants. So public opinion matters in this story. Um, by, um, you know, a, a, allowing demonstrators to go ahead and stage an authorized protest, um, the authorities are effectively influencing um, demonstrators' ability to generate support, gain the support of public opinion, and here, people in the middle are, are very important. So people who don't have crystallized opinions about the regime or the opposition, and also um, help legitimize, uh, legitimize responsive repression. And um, you, you know, going back to Tara's argument, what's the difference with democracies? I think this idea exists in, in a lot of work on, uh, on protest authorizations during the civil rights movement, right? So social movement scholarship speaks about stigmatization, how, um, you know, insidious strategies of, of legal repression are used to discredit uh, targeted groups, and, and this is, and this is uh, along the same lines. Um, for research on the audiences of, of preventive repression, I guess what this implies is that when preventive repression is, is observable, its audience is, is perhaps broader than, than assumed. When we think about preventive repression as a strategy that, um, you know, it, it is intended to take place in the dark, and precisely meant to be invisible, right? Um, this is, this is the, the main argument. Of course, if we look at direct effects, there are, there are other benefits to, to autocrats. Pablo mentioned a, a sorting effect that is introduced um, when the government sees who goes ahead and who doesn't. Uh, but for today's talk that focuses on, on public opinion, these are some of the propositions I will try to um, unpack and test and show uh, for you. Um, I think there, there are some scope conditions um, we must clarify before we go any further. And those um, concern, you know, perhaps the conditions under which we can expect preventive repression to be most effective at, um, you know, achieving the government's objectives. And here I propose that, you know, preventive repression may more effectively influence people's views of the opposition and indeed of responsive repression. When demonstrators are perceived to be you know, choosing to stage unauthorized events. So they have a choice and they choose to go ahead with an authorized protest, be it to either demonstrate their quality as committed opposition, or um, indeed to you know, maximize disruption, chaos, and visibility in the media. So what this assumes is that these strategies are more effective in environments where governments um, perhaps mix and match their strategies, right? If the government always denies protest authorizations and then everybody demonstrates, there is no sorting effect and then the information is not very clear. Similarly, when the government always allows protests to go ahead, the, 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 the informational effects are not, are not clear either. 
Now, the other condition I, I'd say is important is that um, there are consequences to participation in unauthorized events. So when bystanders, when people at home perceive that demonstrators or protest organizers are exposing their supporters to avoidable risk of adverse, they may be more hostile towards them. So again, this assumes that preventive and responsive repression were in a context where they, they are used as complements and not as substitutes. So if, we if we're in a world where the government um, denies authorizations but then does nothing, so either because it lacks the capacity to do so or because it, it doesn't want to, then um, the consequences are limited. And finally, this is the proposition I will test and, and, and I will show you to you. I say that preventive repression is more effective when the law and the authorities tasked with implementing the law are perceived as legitimate. And by legitimate, I mean as able to, to determine acceptable behavior. Um, in places like Russia, for example, where up to, you know, I'll show you some data, but, you know, in places like Russia or Singapore, where people think that, you know what, it is very important to obey the law and where attitudes are not polarized along this dimension then these strategies will be more effective at convincing people and persuading them that you know, these people that have participated in other protest um, are of extremist or, or poor quality. Um, and, and, and these are some scope conditions that I feel are important to, to specify. Now, as I said earlier, and this is the last slide before we move on to the empirics, in today's talk, I'll focus more on how preventive repression influences support for uh, targeted groups, groups that dissent despite obstruction, and how beliefs about the legitimacy of the law condition um, these this effects. Um, any questions before we move on to the empirics? Like no questions. Great, great, excellent. Um, so, so we'll move on to the empirics. Uh, as I said, I've been working on this project for, for, for a long number of years now, so um, we have been fortunate enough to, you know, receive support both from the UK Research Councils and, and, and the NSF as part of the Russian Election Study Service with a fantastic team of co-authors, so and in addition to all the protest and data collection that we've been doing, so um, Forgive me as I take, you know, a few minutes to walk you through some descriptive statistics before we jump into the experimental part of the study, which I think will, will help paint a clearer picture of what, of what the situation was in Russia and what people felt about these types of events. So, um, what, what I show here, again, relying on this, those hand-coded data that, that we feel very confident in uh, from 2017, 2018, is that the Russian authorities um, were very strategic at denying protest authorizations for a range of groups. So this was not, although Navalny supporters were the ones most likely to be targeted, other movements, local activists, private citizens, um, you know, and, and left movements were also likely to face preventive repression in Russia. And, and, and you can see the distribution um, here. Russia also presents with important various national variation um, in, in protest authorization patterns. And this makes sense um, given that this is a very well decentralized policy. And I should say it was always a decentralized policy since protest authorizations were, were introduced um, in 1988, 1989, when the, the Soviet Union was on, on its knees um, and the authorities decided that they had to do something to deal with ethnic mobilization. And Mark Eisinger has, has written extensively on this. Um, uh, you know, patterns are, are predictably not random. Ethnic republics, the ones that are more repressive, were also the ones more likely to reject authorizations um, this period. And also, and I think this is important for the empirics that come up, Russia also offers the, an important variation in, in the combination of preventive and responsive repression that, that I mentioned earlier. So just focusing on a, on a single day of protest that allows me to hold protest organizers constant, their demands constant, their, their grievances, the timing, et cetera, we can see that although the arrest rates, so demonstrator arrest rates are higher in unauthorized protest than, than fully or partly unauthorized. And by partly, I think I should clarify, these are events that take place on the day indicated by demonstrators, but in a different location. So there is some modification and some negotiation on, on the authorization pattern. Um, not all events that are unauthorized uh, face arrest. And this is important because it gives us variation to understand whether you know, the effects of 
of arrests of parental repression are conditional on the use of responsive repression later on um, or not. Um, had all unauthorized protests been um, met with arrests the way that they are today, I should, I should add, um, we would not have you know, the, the, the empirical variation we needed in order to test, to test expectations. Um, now you may ask, um, what do Russians think? Uh, what have they thought about these events? What do they still think about these events? What, what, what do ordinary citizens um, know? So I think it has been um, interesting to see that already from 2019, when, when we started running these types of surveys, um, individuals were, were Russians were, were split. Um, and I think there was pretty much consensus that unauthorized protests were, were undesirable. And I think this is important uh, to note that this, this discrepancy in, in support or normative acceptance of authorized and unauthorized events um, was present when we looked at the full sample of respondents or when we, we, we continue to subset to either those who supported the ruling regime and were willing to, to vote for Putin or not, so non-regime voters. Um, Russians also seem to understand very well that lacking authorization was a protest characteristic that could lead to arrest. Indeed, one in three respondents in, in a survey we ran in 2019 cited lack of authorization as a protest characteristic that could lead to arrests. And still, this is you know, very new, very fresh survey evidence from the Russian election study that was in the field in, in August, so months um, before the invasion. There is, um, you know, we have significant evidence that even in 2021, after everything that had happened with, you know, the 2019 events, the 2021 uh, arrest of, of, of Navalny and, and those unauthorized protests, one in two Russians still felt that, you know, requiring authorization for protest was actually, you know, justified and, and was acceptable. And this was um, much higher than. Uh, their beliefs about justification for other types of, of repressive, um, violent and non-violent repressive activities, such as arresting the organizers of unauthorized protest. Again, almost 47% um, of respondents said that it is justified, um, some more fully justified to arrest the organizers of events, um, but much higher than um, you know, support for other repressive activities that did not involve violence, such as foreign agent declarations, one in three people thought that that was, you know, under some conditions justified, and also the blocking of foreign websites, again, much lower support for, for these activities, um, even, even in, in, in August last year. Okay, so enough said with the descriptives, we can now jump into, into the empirics, um, and I'm going to present evidence from, from two different approaches. First, um, just to you know, um, bolster some confidence in the, in the external validity of the experiments that follow, um, I will present observational data that rely on the combination of protest event and public opinion data to um, you know, provide some initial evidence of whether um, protest, unauthorized and authorized protest have the same effect on local public opinion, right? Um, the design, uh, which relies on evidence from the, um, from a single day of protest, June 2017. These are uh, unauthorized. Uh, these are a combination of authorized and unauthorized protests that were staged by Alexei Navalny and his and his team all across Russia on the same day. Um, asks so so we collect information on those protests and we connect um, protest event data with evidence from surveys that were fielded in Russia just a few weeks after the protest. So, so the, the, the event was on, on June 12th and, and, um, and then the, the Levada Omnibus was, was in the field a few days later. Uh, these are face-to-face -face nationally representative surveys and we actually matched respondents to protest tests whether protests that take place in one's locality and locality here is defined as, 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 as the city level um, influence their support for protest participants. And as I said earlier, the design exploits variation in the type of protests that take place in localities um, and allows me to hold you know, the time of the protest, the organizers, the grievances constant. Um, the design has some additional advantages because first, uh, grievances were popular. Uh, demonstrators were condemning government corruption, and we know that Russians are, are, are very aggrieved with corruption and disapprove um, of, of high-level 
government corruption. And also um, observationally, we know that on the day, on, on June 12th, um, Navalny said that events would, and, and the teams, the local teams were committed for the protests to go ahead, whether they had secured permission or not. That means that we can be quite confident that places that we treat um, you know, without any protest were places where no permits were submitted and no events um, took place. Of course, there are, you know, there's a wealth of concerns with this type of observational data. That's why we have experiments coming up and Dogen 80 being a key concern. Do, does public opinion influence you know, authorizations and does it influence support for demonstrators? So bear with me, we will jump to the um, you know, nicely causally identified part in a minute. So, but what does that, what does the evidence suggest? Well, first of all, we see that um, support for demonstrators self-reported in public opinion surveys was in general a lot lower in places with unauthorized as opposed to authorized events by almost half percentage point. We also see significant differences as a function of the combination of preventive and responsive repression, so unauthorized protest and arrests. Support for demonstrators, again, as captured in opinion surveys, is lower in places with all unauthorized protest um, where demonstrators did not meet arrest as opposed to places with authorized protest where again, no demonstrators uh, were arrested. Um, I can speak more of these models. These are all um, region fixed effects model just to make sure that, th that there are people um, in localities within the same region and, and influenced by different, um, you know, by, by the same dynamics. They're vast in controlling for regional democracy, support for Navalny as captured in previous surveys. But, you know, just, just descriptively, this is what they seem to suggest. Um, experimentally, um, to test expectations, um, as I mentioned earlier, there are several experiments that had hopefully allowed us to disentangle the effect of preventive repression to that of um, ensuing demonstrator and police tactics. So in September 2020, we ran a factorial two by two by two uh, survey experiment in which respondents randomly um, split into exper eight experimental groups were provided in with information about different um, demonstrator and police tactics, and also about different, um, the, the status of protest, whether authorized or not. So they were told that somewhere in our region, demonstrators um, agreed, um, submitted a notification. The authorities agreed, did not agree, and then uh, protesters were peaceful or clashed with the police, and uh, subsequently arrests were made and, and were not made. Um, I should say earlier that this is a factorial and, and noted conjoint. We're very constrained in, in designing a conjoint experiment as, as the, the survey um, company was filming some of the questionnaires in paper. And so we were advised to go ahead with them um, with a factorial. But of course, I understand that there are many other dimensions that we could have varied even, even in this setup. Um, so presented with this scenarios, respondents were subsequently asked whether um, they support the activities of each party and they support similar events in general, and whether they would be themselves willing to participate in, in similar protest in, in the future. And I think what is really nice with this design is that it allows us to compare the effect of preventive repression, demonstrator tactics, and police arrests on each outcome of interest. Okay. So what we see is that providing respondents with information about unauthorized protest as opposed to authorized dampens both their approval of demonstrators and their willingness to participate in similar uh, protest. What is interesting is that the effect of unauthorized, of, of preventive repression, unauthorized protest is comparable in magnitude to that of the violent demonstrators treatment, right? Um, Police arrests do not seem to impact support for demonstrators, but they do seem to, um, and, and neither do they influence support um, for, for similar protests. Yes, Tara. Yeah, so this is really interesting. I guess I have a question with the sort of the 2017 Navalny protests in light of both the observational and experimental evidence. So the question is, so, in your mind, was it a mistake for Navalny at all to protest in the places that they were unauthorized to do so in 2017? Because this sort of evidence suggests that it um, that it was. And then the question is, you know, because they didn't make that choice to limit their protest, I understand that it's nice to have sort of a single protest with a single organizer, et cetera. But does that mislead us in terms of thinking about what protesters are actually doing uh, when they are told not to protest, you know, 
to avoid making this type of mistake? Yeah, so um, great question. Thank you, Tara. So I would say um, to, to answer this question, I think it's important to, to lay out, you know, the, the type of public opinion, like the model of public opinion I have in mind. So I think in Russia, as well as elsewhere, we have, you know, strong opposition supporters, like the hard court, the um, who, who support um, Navalny, who support opposition minded activists, we have the, the government supporters, again, not, not affected by the sanctions. And then there's a large group of citizens in between, um, without clearly formed opinions who can, uh, you know, shift and, and sway, and, and those are the moderates. I think Navalny's decision to go ahead um, was was very effective at galvanizing the the opposition and and really allowing Navalny to build, you know, momentum and and you know spearhead the, the campaign ahead. Um, I mean, of course, Navalny was not allowed to run, but it was very important at, at you know creating those bonds that social movements need to have or like groups need to have in order to go ahead. It was not successful at gaining the support of, um, you know, average, moderate Russian public opinion. But again, this is, you know, and this has been, you know, concerned with the Russian opposition. But I guess what this research shows is that the opposition's ability to generate support is very much endogenous to, to these insidious strategies that the government is using. Now, is it misleading? So I think, you know, uh, we know that preventive repression is seldom effective. Um, I, I think um, I, didn't, um, I mentioned earlier about three to four percent of protests there 2017 2018 were successfully thwarted. We know that those protests, however, were heavily, you know, skewed by by the national days of protest that Navalny was organizing. Um, but it is more likely, and, and you're absolutely right, it is more likely for Navalny organizations it was to, to go ahead with an authorized protest than, than for other perhaps more moderate groups such as local organizations. I should say this is no longer the case in Russia. The, the system has been, like the process has been completely discredited. Um, and, you know, substantively knowing how these groups responded, I think it's, it's given their importance in, in Russian politics uh, also matters. Uh, but thank you very much for both of these questions. I, I see another hand. Giacomo? Yeah, hi. Um, so I guess my, my question is more broadly about, uh, so what, what different mechanisms uh, can be at play here? Because it seems to me that, uh, um, so each of these effects may be capturing a perhaps uh, like different mechanisms, right? Because like, uh, um, so information about the fact that a protest was violent uh, or that protesters, protesters were arrested uh, gives you like information about uh, like what happened uh, exposed in a sense, uh, right? So what happened after the protest was staged, uh, whereas like knowing that the protest was unauthor unauthorized, uh, in some sense, it gives you information about, uh, um, like, um, perhaps like the motivation that uh, the protesters had, uh, you know, to begin with. And so it seems to me that the, the kind of, um, so the, the, the kind of mechanism that is behind, so the, the, the type, the kind of processing uh, um, of information that, uh, that the respondents uh, do may be different. So I was wondering, like, uh, if, there are like different uh, theories uh, that uh, may account for uh, uh, different mechanisms or if there is like uh, a unique framework like social, how should I compare like uh, these effects? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so I, I think that, that that's a great question. I think this is just, you know, it's stylistically showing how, how, how they compare and manage it, but you're absolutely right. These are different effects. I guess what's important for me with this experiment is to show that, look, Unauthorized protest preventive repression has an effect even when we control for you know whether demonstrators were violent or not and whether the police made arrest. A concern if we just told people protests were unauthorized, full stop, do you support them? Is that they could infer different things about their tactics, they could infer different things about the, the probability of re police response very much consistent with the observational data um, I just shared. But of course, we know that, you know, from research on, on nonviolent repression for uh, nonviolent resistance, I'm sorry that, you know, violent protesters, they're left find it harder to generate support, identification with them is lower. And I think that those could, could be in place here. But thank you for the question. Um, I see Arturas has this question as well. Yeah, hi, Katya. So I'm still struggling to understand how to interpret these results and i buy your interpretation but i also think that 
there are many alternative ways to think about what the message that the process was, protest was unauthorized could imply uh, for the receiver, right? It, it would seem that for many practical purposes, knowing that government did not authorize the protest in the context of Russia would imply that protest was anti-government protest, right? That it was probably not pro-government rally, et cetera, right? So you, what you might be picking here is that essentially people who are in line with you know with the with the government who has support the the, the 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 you know the central government or the local government be it uh they simply make an inference that this is you know uh, uh, that this is something government protest and that's what you're picking up is essentially those people are less likely to approve this action so could this just be a different way of labeling the ideological nature of the protest and the result you see is due to that yeah yeah great question thank you Atra. so here's what i did in previous um versions of this experiment we said explicitly protest were political um right and, and the effects remain consistent with this design what i show is that effects are consistent when we look at um regime supporters, opposition supporters. So everybody updates in the same direction. Also Navalny supporters and, and non-Navalny supporters. So updating is consistent. I think this is a concern, like informational equivalence, like what do people think? Um, I'm, not, I'm not able to address with this design, but I think in future iterations, um, you know, naming demonstrators, naming their demands would be a helpful way forward. Doing so would of course, um, limit our ability to generalize from said organizer and, and, and said demand, but um, absolutely um, uh, agreed. Now, where we do find heterogeneity, though, and I think this is, um, oh, sorry, this is worth mentioning, um, is, is when it comes to people's priors uh, about the legitimacy of the law. And this question um, was asked uh, as follows. So we asked, do you believe that demonstrators should obey the law under all circumstances, or are there any conditions when they should just do whatever they want? And, and what seems to predict heterogeneity, especially in the effect of unauthorized protest and preventive repression, are these prior beliefs, and, and I mean prior like beliefs, about the legitimacy of the law and of the authorities. Um, people who find that the law is illegitimate do not update when presented with information about preventive repression. But those that feel that the law is legitimate and should be obeyed do so and they update in a negative direction. Now, what I think happens in Russia and what happened in 2020 is that we still did not have um, you know, public opinion being polarized along this dimension. So about 50% uh, of people who voted for the opposition um, um, felt that the law was legitimate, 70% of those who voted for the authorities. So th there was still, you know, consensus on the need to obey the law and really follow the authorities' decision. And again, I, this is very much Russia specific. Had we replicated the, the, you know, we ran the experiment in Turkey where, you know, we know from um, surveys, people are split, it's a 50-50 distribution on whether people think that the law and the authorities are legitimate, um, results of, would have been um, very different. Um, I don't know if that has answered um, the question. Yeah, all right. Um, and, and finally, um, I said beliefs about the law are important, um, but there is a, a catch, right? There, there is a threat and there is a danger to the authorities continuing to abuse the law and using it as an instrument of repression. Um, I cannot isolate the effect of these other, you know, strategies from everything else that has gone on in Russia in the past few years. But what I can say is that, you know, in these repeated surveys over time, what we have seen is, is a decline in the share of, of public opinion who thinks that um, the law is legitimate. It, it was around 60% September 2020. Um, in the last round of the Russian election survey, that was, you know, in the field just weeks before the invasion, this has dropped, this had dropped to around, you know, below, uh, below 50%. Um, so what this implies, and I guess it speaks back to the um, scope conditions of the project that, that I introduced uh, earlier, is that, of course, the authorities can, um, can use the law, dictators can use the law as an instrument of repression, but the more they do so, the, the more the, the law loses its, um, its price point. Um, 
and its, its ability to persuade. So as the share of persuadable citizens shrinks, right, as the share of people who think that demonstrators should obey the law and follow the authorities' decisions shrinks, the ability of, you know, this type of preventive repression, protest authorizations, but also other strategies that use the language of the law to persuade about the quality of the opposition will, I think, decline. Um, okay, we had, um, um, I keep an eye on the clock. Um, so we, we had a brief discussion about mechanisms and I want to show you, um, that, that's the last experiment I'm gonna show. I want to show you how um, different, you know, authorization patterns um, influence whom people blame for arrests that, that take place during the protest, because I also think that it is important. So again, this is another factorial um, run in 2021, where um, um, the only difference is that people are told that everybody was arrested, right? So as before, um, two by two by two factorial, eight experimental groups, people are told that, you know, um, organizers submitted a notification, people agreed, did not agree to the protest. Now we're prime people to think about the lawfulness of the events. So they're explicitly told that, you know, either told that unauthorized protests are unlawful, they're against the law or they're lawful or no priming. And then they're presented with information about protester tactics. So they're told demonstrators were peaceful, demonstrators um, clashed with the police. And in both experiments, I should say, these are very mild treatments, you know, clashing with the police, the police arresting demonstrators. And this is another shortcoming that has to be acknowledged, right? So it is a very different story when, you know, responsive repression consists of um, beatings or, you know, um, direct attacks against the crowd and, and, and arrests. And, and these are all, you know, um, limitations. Um, yeah, I, I see Professor Shavorsky has a question. I'm sorry to take you just one step back, but do you think that people uh, think that uh, that they obey because in general people should obey the law or it's because protests are bad? Is it sort of a general posture toward obeying law or is it that a priori people think that protests are destabilizing, commotion, et cetera? Thank you for this question. I think in the Russian context, um, it is to some extent about people's um, normative beliefs and normative support for the law. And I say this because in addition to this question that focuses specifically on demonstrators, we also asked whether uh, people should um, you know, follow the law, not protesters, people should follow the law in all circumstances, or it's fine for them to sometimes go on and do their minds. This is a classic you know, of the European social surveys questions. And responses to those two were highly correlated. So I think there, there is something about the normative uh, belief about, about the law, but I think you know, that that's one component, though I think looking at the history of protest in, in, in Russia and you know, this non-violent tradition of the, of the Soviet dissident movement, and the, there is also a sense that violent protests are, are bad, um, unauthorized protests are also bad, and these perceptions are very much endogenous to how the, the, the authorities frame the events and, and how they present them. But thank you very much for, for your question and, and for attending. I appreciate it. Um, okay. Uh, sh shall I um, shall I just show this final uh, results and, and, and yes yes please thank you thank you yeah so as I said so what happens to blame attributions um, whom do people blame for arrest we know that's a key mechanism of of how people um, you know make sense of protest it's a key predictor of backlash mobilization etc and I guess what what I want to just draw your attention to. Um, is that when protests are authorized, uh, as opposed to um, unauthorized, people are, are much more likely to blame the police. So I'm sorry, it's not a good graph. So when protests are unauthorized, uh, the police, the blame that's put on the police, it's it's much um, less, it's much lower. And conversely, the, the probability of, of people, survey so respondents, blaming protest organizers for arrests increases. Um, 
Local authorities, uh, so the people who authorize the events, take a greater height, so they're more likely to be blamed um, when, when events are unauthorized, so people do not support, in, in, in principle, the, the authorization. But again, looking at both protest organizers and, and, and protest participants, the protest participants, the, the findings are pretty much mixed, and I think this is, again, consistent with the evidence that it is the leadership, those people who, who drive, you know, the demonstrators in the streets that, that take the blame. Um, this question was framed so that the respondents could only choose one of these categories. The person, like the, the organization or the entity, most likely to be blamed. So, so there is something about uh, blame assignment that moderates um, responses. Okay, um, I think this um, brings towards the end of, of the talk, and, and, I'm, and I really want to share with you some, 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 some of the findings. What does that mean for research on authoritarian politics, uh, repression, et cetera? So I think empirically, what, what this project does is, is to really look at the direct, but also conditional effects of, of preventive repression on public opinion in a non-democracy, where most restrictions and, and protest authorizations, uh, you know, um, as, as repression take place. I think if we think broadly about the type of collective events on data on protest in these regimes, it suggests that you know, it may be helpful in addition to collecting information about protest, um, you know, participants, arrests, et cetera, to also collect information on, on the status of this protest, whether authorized by the authorities or not, because this was really an uh, allow you know, research into the relationship between preventive and responsive repression in these regimes and will allow us to truly theorize when the two are used as complements or substitutes, which I think is an important question. Now, for research on you know, the audiences of preventive repression in general um, and authoritarian resilience, I think an important lesson also you know, in light of, of what's currently happening in, in Russian politics is that truly um, people's attitudes towards the opposition in a very tightly controlled informational environment, but also their dissent decisions are, are, are largely shaped uh, by the actions of the state. They are endogenous to the actions of the state. But it, it also suggests this work that to influence it, their, their beliefs about their opponents, um, contemporary autocrats can use a variety of so costly strategies and not just propaganda. So if you believe these results, they suggest that uh, preventive repression, deliberately designed to be observable, um, persuades, it, it shapes people's beliefs about the opposition, it compromises um, the opposition's ability to generate support, and it does so um, at a much lower cost than, than strategies of repression. It also implies that the boundaries between, you know, repression as a tool of fear and propaganda as, as a tool of persuasion may be a bit more blurry than, than we had assumed, and I think this is an, an exciting area for, for future work. Um, all, all that's left for me to say is, is to thank you. Um, this is the project website. As I said, this, this work is, is very generously funded by the UKRI, um, and, and I would be very happy to take a, any, any questions you have in, in the remaining, um, how many minutes we have? Yeah, we have still like uh, 15 minutes, so great, great. we can thank open you. the floor for any additional questions now. Thank you. Hi. So, uh, so I'm just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more about the the intent behind the authorization policy by the government. So I understand what is happening here is that once you give this option, once you can sort of attach label to a protest of whether it is authorized or unauthorized, there is some sorting of opinion. In other words, people tend to update less positively on average about the protest if the process protest is actually unauthorized but so to what extent does it actually imply that this particular policy works and what would it mean for that policy to work i'm still not getting that part of the argument if, if at all it can be made on the basis of, of of this particular research but i'm still trying to, to understand the implied model as to what exactly the government gains by having that particular policy yeah, thank you, thank you, Arturus. So I think the government learns and gains much more than just public opinion. And I think that focusing the, the talk today on public opinion didn't, didn't do justice to that part of the argument. So first of all, the, the government um, collects information about the underlying sources of, of discontent. It, under, it gains information about 
you know, what, what is happening, who wants to demonstrate and, and why. It also allows the government a buffer in, in which to decide and prevent the opposition from spreading information about protest, right? So according to the law, by the time, all the time that these decisions are, are being reviewed, the opposition cannot spread information about a protest because this is illegal. So, so it creates a buffer, right? But it is a dangerous buffer because it's only imposed a few days before, before a protest. So if the counterfactual is what happens in China, for example, so preventive detentions a month before um, um, you know, sensitive periods, think about Rory Trix's work, that's a much safer buffer than this that's imposed three days before of a protest. So this is what the government learns. So this is what it knows. It's, a, it's an information revelation mechanism as well. Then the second thing, um, it also allows the government to sort the opposition, right? Um, I think it, it, it's very informative, maybe not for established opposition like Navalny, but remember there was a time when the government didn't have really much information about who these groups were, what they were doing, that it was important for them to reveal their quality. And, and I think we can assume that groups that go ahead despite repression reveal themselves to be of higher resolve than those that you know, signal loyalty by staying back. And you can think of the communists in, in this context. The communists, for example, protest by the communists are more likely to say, we'll step back, um, we'll, we'll revise and, and go ahead. There is a, um, you know, there's a concern about opposition coordination as well. Uh, if you look at, you know, within the liberals in Russia, there's been a few occasions when they, they split, they decided not to go ahead together because they disagreed over the authorization. So these are all the things the government learns um, beyond just, you know, these public opinion effects that I discussed. Um, of course, it's contingent on the system working and the opposition complying and still submitting notifications. In recent months, the system has been so discredited that the opposition is not submitting, nobody's submitting notifications and this whole system is not working. But thank you for the question. I, I hope it has answered. Um, so my question is more of an Arturo's question than what he has, which is, so you suggested at the beginning that uh, repressing protests or not allowing protests and then reacting against them uh, actually increases the support for the government among some other sectors. Is that actually what you're maintaining? I mean, is there, is there a law and order reaction? Yes, in the US, we know that uh, repressing protests, Nixon here and whatnot, was uh, a way of building support for the government. Um, thank you. Thank you for, for, for the opportunity to clarify. So I think that that, that was more that, you know, um, it, it doesn't build active support for the government, or at least not. Um, in across public opinion in general, or, or those we identify as government supporters in, in the survey. But what it does is that it dampens the, the negative reputational effects of arrests. So um, every time the, the police arrest demonstrators, the, the police and also the authorities pay a reputational cost. So this is something you know, that has been consistent in all surveys. Russians are, are not supportive of arrests. There, there is great antipathy for, for such responses. So even government responses do not want to see the government responding to um, protests with violence. What, an authorized, what authorization does is that to some extent, um, I would say legitimizes or justifies uh, responsive repression to the extent that it doesn't have to pay such a big reputational cost when it does arrest demonstrators or when bystanders come across the government, um, you know, being repressive against its own people. The response you describe is, is very well possible. We haven't been able to find it in, in, in opinion data, but, but I can imagine like a distribution of, of government supporters, some of them being so concerned about order and, and stability and those on, on the tele, you know on the end of the distribution responding. And, and this is indeed very interesting to, to look into um, as, as we proceed with the project. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the question. Um, hi, uh, it's great to see this work um, develop. I think it's a really exciting project and you're totally correct that we need more information about how these protests are permitted and how that affects things like repression. Um, my question is sort of about um, if you have any insight into the process by which the permits are granted. I know in a lot of cases, they don't just outright 
rejects the um, the protest permit or like the notification of the protest. Although I think it's a little bit different with Navalny specifically. In a lot of cases, they will offer a different location that is unsuitable to the protest organizers. And I know actually on June 12th that happened um, in quite a large number of um, of settings. So instead of saying, you know, we want to protest in the middle of the city, the government will be like, no, you can't do that, but you can protest in this park on the outskirts of the city. And then uh, the Navalny organization was like, no, we would accept that. Um, that's, you know, we won't be visible. That's marginalizing our protest. We're going to protest illegally. Um, so I was wondering um, how that um, process sort of fits in with your theory and to what extent, you know, it, you feel that serves the, um, I guess, is um, encouraging people to think of these protests as, I don't know, more illegal, I guess. Yeah, thank you, Sasha. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think this is a great point and it speaks to the argument that, you know, the government tries to present demonstrators as electing to go ahead with, with an unauthorized protest. As Sasha said, you know, it's very common for the authorities to push demonstrators in the outskirts of cities or, you know, to push protest in the very early hours of the morning. That was also the case on, 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 uh, on June 12th, the protest at seven o'clock. But, but thinking about it, these are all obstacles, insidious obstacles that compromise demonstrators' ability to generate awareness, which is the first step to generating support um, for their demands. Uh, the process can be very complicated at times. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've, you've looked into this as well in your work. Uh, courts will interfere. The, the, the opposition has had the, the right to, to you know, oppose the authorities' decisions. Sometimes very brave courts go against the authorities, and that creates friction and, and you know, within different branches, which again begs the question, that this is indeed a costly strategy. So, so there is a cost to pay. But, but thank you for, for the opportunity to, to clarify. Thank you. It's nice to see you as well. Yeah. Um, Sarah? Yeah. So I just wanted to follow up on sort of your response to my earlier question and some things you said to Adam. So, I mean, I'm interested in this idea that, you know, at least with respect to these 2017 protests, both Navalny got what he wanted in terms of mobilizing supporters and in municipalities or wherever, um, uh, you know, the protest was denied, maybe the government got a boost. But I guess the question then is, like, what is it exactly that the government is trying to maximize in terms of public opinion? Is it like some marginal person or is it trying to demobilize like the most uh, opposition, like the strongest opposition supporters? And if so, I just wondered what sort of the implications for this type of, you know, survey experiment would be in terms of what estimates you're presenting, et cetera. Yeah, thank you, Tara. Great, great questions. I think what the government is trying to do is to prevent the moderates from defecting to the opposition. Um, it's it's preventing, you know, increasing the distance between the moderates, like the large, the vast majority of people, and 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 the opposition, right? Um, I think this this is the strategy, and, and you know, demobilizing the moderates or making sure that the moderate moderates do not switch sides is is a key strategy for for all authoritarians. Um, I know the government, I think the government has, has decided that, you know, the, the strong opposition committed liberals, you know, are, are a lost cause. And we see this not just by the way they deal with protests, but also by the way they dealt with independent media, right? They were willing to tolerate um, independent voices as long as they were, you know, not, not, not spreading out to, to, new, to new people. And every time there was an attempt you know, bid from independent media or from the opposition to reach out to the moderates, to, to new audiences, that was when we saw the government clamping down. You know, speaking today, I think that, that you know, this concern that the moderates will begin to shift also explains, you know, the response of the Russian government, uh, the repressive response to independent media and, and, and lots of others we have seen. Um, so for the estimates, I, I think we do have those moderates um, in the survey, they're, they're overrepresented, those who, who do not strong, have strong views for either uh, the regime um, or the opposition, underrepresented by, by default are, you know, the strong Navalny supporters, uh, but, but we have different ways to get at them, you know, bits, um, you know targeted surveys, um, oversampling online where they're represented, and, and this does, of course, constitute a, a very good way forward. Um, but thank you, thank you for your questions and, and, and for, for engaging with the work. I, I do appreciate it. Um, I think... Yeah. So, uh, could you could you speculate wildly, based on your research, as to why 
Russia imposes a blanket ban on, on protest right now? Yeah, so this is a very different world um, we are in, uh, obviously, from, from what it was. I think these strategies, as I said earlier, are, are very costly, and they assume that the government, A, cares about the moderates, um, perhaps because it's secure in its own supporters and is not worried about shifts in, in that direction, and B, the government feels um, strong enough in order to you know, confront everything that, that's going to come. There's a blanket ban on protest today. Um, I should say consistently applied since the, since the, the coronavirus pandemic. And there's also you know, lack of reference to these events. We, we don't see the, the, the publicizing that, that we saw in 2021 or in 2020, um, sorry, 17. Um, that, that reflects you know, the extraordinary circumstances and the insecurity, I would say, of, of the authorities. I think now a question is not really the, the, the moderate shifting to the opposition. The opposition has been you know, disseminated since, since the spring of 2021. There was a complete shift in gear and completely shift in, in strategies um, since Navalny got back. And that, I think, reflects um, insecurity and, and the different world we're in. Thank you. Ivan? Yes, um, just a brief question about like uh, the blanket ban that exists right now, which started before the war yeah. and uh, which functions under the disguise of anti-COVID uh, restrictions. So like just a brief question, do you think that there could be different reactions to the um, uh, to the lack of authorizations and like restrictions on protests that are related to the general law and order uh, considerations and those that are tied to the anti-COVID um, policy. So, so just to make sure I understand, do you mean that the public will, whether the people will respond differently to, to these two different? Uh, yes, like in terms of public opinion, how do people like respond? Do they view this differently that they're like compatriots turn out to protests despite those protests being essentially banned because of COVID? Do they buy the COVID, um, the COVID interpretation? Um, so I think this is, this is a very good question. I don't have the, the survey evidence to support it, uh, to, to support my answer, but, but I think what is really insidious and frustrating with the strategies is that they always come up with these, you know, seemingly politically neutral excuses, like, you know, um, in Corona, you know, COVID, or um, you know, there is another protest or disruption to pedestrians, or we need to clean the streets from snow, you know, and and that dampens responses. But in in the past year, I would say a lot of things have changed. So the the law has been discredited. Um, we already saw that from January 2021, but we also see this now. Protest organizers, and I mean, who who has who has stayed behind from protest organizers, no longer try to engage with the authorization system. It, it has been discredited. Um, and you know, in 2021, there was some regional variation. Some Navalny officers would, would try to get a permit; others did not. But I think right now, there's no engagement, precisely because there's, there's no way to secure authorization uh, for, for, for any of these events. All unauthorized protests are, are met with arrests even before that they, they, they take place um, and they're not uh, publicized. So again, I think that means that information about them is, is, is restrained and it's confined um, to, to much smaller subset than we would have um, anticipated and under those protests that I spoke about. Um, I guess in a sense, the scope conditions of the theory and, and the theory applies to a different Russia, to, to the one we have today, and, and to a different set of electoral autocracies um, than now. Right, thank you. Great, so we're just on time. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Katya, for a wonderful and you know timely talk. So uh, yeah, it was a pleasure having you, and uh, we hope to have you visiting us in person very soon. Thank you. I appreciate everyone's comments and attendance. I'm, I'm very grateful for your feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.